That makes it hard to preach. <laughs> so, oh well. Um, back to doing what I do. <laughs> Let me have another word of prayer for the message then. Father, thank you again for your goodness. For you, you are truly good. And as we just recently, just before saying about your love for us, that it's, uh, Father, your unending, uh, perfect love that has been poured out upon us uh, through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in uh, your word here that we see that. And we sang about that in the song where Jesus uh, wept or, or sweated um, you know, great drops of blood, as it were, because of he knew the pain and suffering he was going to go through, and and then willingly doing that, and knowing that he had the power to completely resist those who came to arrest him, yet he surrendered his life completely, humbled himself, that he might go and die there for us. And so, as we continue in the book of Mark here, and we, we review these things that many of us have already seen before, continue to open our eyes to your truth and what you would have us to know and to understand from this message here today. We give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a young couple who was struggling a bit with their finances. Uh, the young man uh, was very good at finances. He always balanced to his checkbooks. He was very good at keeping up with the finances. But his wife, not so, not so much. Um, and he knew this before they got married. They had understood it during premarital counseling that she wasn't really that good with money and he handled the money most of the time. But, but she loved to buy things and spend things and she often didn't know how much was in the checking account. So he took and set her down and taught her how to balance the checkbook and how to keep track of the money and to know what was going on. And so as he thought she kind of grasped it, he started giving her more responsibility with balancing the checkbook. But then one day, uh, a letter came from the bank, a check was returned for insufficient funds. And so he set her down and he said, honey, um, I hate to do this, but i got to share this with you. This, this check was returned from the, you know, from the bank, uh, from that, you know, the check you wrote to the department store. She went, oh good, now I can spend that money on something else. Uh, have you ever tried to explain something to somebody and they, they just couldn't get it? They, you know, you, you, you go over it and over it and they just don't grasp the concept. Uh, and you just wonder, why can't you get this? Or maybe you've been on the other end of that and someone's explained to you over and over again and you go, I just, I just, just, it's beyond my ability to comprehend. You know, when we look through and studied through the book of Mark, looking back, of course, having 20-20 vision looking back, sometimes we see the disciples and we go, can't you get it? Don't you see what's going on? Jesus has told you very clearly what is going to happen. And we saw last week that they just didn't get it. When Jesus was finally arrested, they just couldn't believe it. Jesus told them, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried, I'm going to rise again. And they didn't get it. But even more so than that, even bigger than that, was the religious leaders of the nation of Israel. These were the men who were responsible for the law. They were responsible for teaching the people. They were responsible for the spiritual uh teaching and guidance and the spiritual direction for the entire nation. The chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Even more so than the disciples. They didn't get it. Jesus performed miracles. He taught God's truth. He demonstrated love for people. He demonstrated tremendous knowledge and understanding of God in His Word. And, and they didn't get it. Because somewhere deep in their heart, they had their own belief system, their own thoughts, and they could not listen to what was being presented right in front of them. Today we continue the study in the book of Mark. Last week we ended 
in chapter 14 where Jesus was arrested. Uh, the, the crowd comes to where He is on the Mount of Olives. Uh, Judas betrays Him. Remember the story? Judas says, uh, tells the, the, this, this group of guards, these group of people with, with swords and clubs, that the one I go up and kiss on the cheek, that's the one that you should arrest. Because it was nighttime and maybe they didn't recognize him. And, and Judas, you go, why Judas? How could you do this? This was, this was the person who you spent the last three years with in ministry. And yet, he walks up to Jesus and says, Hail, Master, and walks up and kisses him on the cheek. And of course, the guards begin to arrest him. Peter tries to defend Jesus by pulling out his sword and trying to split open the head of the of this one guy and he winds up cutting off his ear. And Jesus says, I'm not here leading a rebellion. He surrenders himself to be arrested. We pick up the story here with us in Mark chapter 14, verse 53. We're going to finish 14 and get into part of 15. And what we're going to see here is the trial two trials of Jesus. There were actually three, but we see Mark records two of them. But we also see the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy that Peter would deny Him in this passage. But first, verse 53, it says, They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law came together. This is all the religious leaders now. They're coming together. Peter followed Him at a distance, right in the courtyard of the high priest, and there he sat with the guards and warned himself by the fire. So where Peter, initially he runs. We saw that last week. That when Jesus surrendered himself, all the disciples left. Even one young man ran off without his clothes. Which was, we said, was kind of weird, but they were so desperate to leave. And Peter runs, but then he decides to come back and he's following at a distance. He's in the courtyard and he's waiting to see what happens. It says the chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they could find no, they could not find him. Now the Sanhedrin was this, uh, this judging, this ruling council of representatives of all these chief priests and Pharisees and Sadducees. It was this ruling council that would make judgments about people and judgments about things going on in the nation of Israel. And so they came together. Now this was unusual for them to come together in the middle of the night. They didn't normally do this, but what, what typically would happen is when someone was arrested and brought in, the trial was held very quickly. And so if Jesus was arrested, normally they would wait till the next day. But they're in such a hurry now to try Jesus, in the middle of the night, they bring Him to the high priest. The Sanhedrin pull, comes together, and then they're trying to find evidence. They're, they're people to come and give testimony. And what would happen, one person would come in and give a testimony. And then they would leave. The next person would come in and give a testimony. And then they would leave. And it says they were trying to find evidence to put him to death. It says many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. One would say he did this, and one would say he did that, and someone said he was over here, and he was over there. And they get all these people coming in, trying to and maybe get in good with the, the high priest, say, we'll testify against Jesus. But you see, when it's all a lie, it doesn't, they can't agree. They're, they're making up stuff. Then some stood up and gave a false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple and in three days we'll build it. Not, uh, build another not made by man. Yet even their testimony did not agree. They couldn't agree on what Jesus said about the temple. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. He didn't need to give an answer because they didn't agree. It was all false testimony. But then the high priest asked, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Now Jesus answers, I am. Yes, I am Messiah. I am the Son of God. He would not deny that because it's who He was. I am, he says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming in the clouds of heaven. They said, you will see me one day because I will rise and I will sit at the hand of God Almighty and I will come again. 
But you know this is all true. But notice the response of the high priest. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? This is, you know, this tearing of your clothes, which seems kind of weird to us. But we've seen a similar type thing happen in our nation. When someone, groups of people, some now get angry about something, what do they do? They get together and they go out and they break things and they destroy other people's businesses and they set things on fire and they just, they just go nuts because they don't like what happened. It's the same type of thing. He's so angry, he's so angry about this that he just rips his clothes. It was an expression of extreme anger. And he said, he accuses Jesus of blasphemy. And they all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit on him and they blindfolded him and struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. We, when we used to go to a camp. I had a pastor and he always led this youth camp. It was called Ichthus Camp. Ichthus is, uh, the word Ichthus means fish and each of the letters of the, of the letters is an acronym for Jesus Christ, God, Son, Savior. But anyway, it was this camp for kids. And so I went a couple times as a counselor and the counselors would, you know, be in the cabins with the kids and guide them all throughout the week. And you'd always have some of the, the kids there, the students that came and they were a little bit troublemakers or, or sometimes the, the, the counselors and the campers would kind of get in a, you know, friendly banter back and forth about something and it was all in fun. Well, the very end, the very end, the last day of camp, we had kangaroo court. And kangaroo court was it was the opportunity for all the counselors to bring trumped up charges against the students. So if you had some student you wanted to have some fun with, you would come up with some wild, crazy charge, and it was you know it was it was always foolishness. But you come up with some charge, and the pastor who was who was leading the camp, he would sit up on a stage with a he had a robe around him and some kind of hat, and so you would make your charge against the student, and the and and the ruling was always. Guilty without mercy. <laughs> and so then the student would have to do some foolish thing, say something, recite something, or do something silly. But it was all, you know, it was all staged. And that's what we call a kangaroo court. It, it, there was no, the verdict was always going to be guilty. That's what a kangaroo court is. It doesn't matter what evidence you, bro you brought. It's already, everything is staged to make sure that the person is guilty. And that was all in fun and games. But what we see here in this court here is a kangaroo court. They were bound and determined to find something to kill Jesus for. And they couldn't get testimonies, so they finally, they couldn't get any testimonies to agree, so they finally had to accuse him of blasphemy. And that, that was enough. That, that was enough to kill him. It was, it was staged. It was set. They were going to find some reason, no matter what they had to do, to condemn Jesus so that they could get rid of him. This is the kangaroo court. Jesus is condemned now for blasphemy. Notice, they couldn't find anything wrong. No sin could they find in the life of Jesus. The only thing that he was, he was accused for was blasphemy, claiming to be equal to God. That was, that was his claim. Not only are you Messiah, but Son of the Blessed One, the Son of God. Earlier in Jesus' teaching, when He claimed to be the Son of God, they, they said, we understand this, you're claiming to be equal with God. And, and Jesus didn't deny that. Being the Son of God was equal with God Almighty, with the Father. And they've condemned Him here for blasphemy. You see, evil people, ungodly people, don't need a justifiable reason to accuse, to attack, or to slander people they disagree with. Evil people don't need a justifiable reason to attack others. When the mind becomes so focused on what you want, whether it's right or wrong, whether you want it, you will do anything to get your way. I, I see that happening in our country all over. We've become so individualistic. We're so focused on what I want that what I want is more important than what anybody else wants. And if I have to fight, cheat, steal, or lie to get it, I'll do it. 
And this is what's happening. This is what happened to these people. They were so angry at Jesus. They were so mad because He taught truth. He taught things that were opposed to what they taught. Because they weren't all teaching truth. They taught some truth, but not all truth. And when Jesus taught the Word of God and taught the truth, it made them mad. And when the crowds came and began to listen to Jesus, it made them mad. And so, from that point on, they began to find reason to, to hate Jesus and now to kill Him. You, you can't change the mind of an evil person. You can't argue down a person whose mindset is already geared towards something that's evil. You can't argue him down. It doesn't matter what it is. Someone who has a different belief than you, if, if their mind is so ingrained in that, you can't argue against that. We have stuff happening in our culture all over today. And you may not agree with this. But I think most of you do. That when you take an unborn child and purposely take its life, you're, you're, you're killing an innocent person. It's not just a blob of flesh. But you have someone who's pro-abortion, you will never argue them down. You will never convince them that this baby in the womb is, is a living thing. Because their minds are so twisted, they're so focused, they convince themselves that this is true, they can't hear it. You see, the only thing that can change a depraved or evil mind is the empowering deliverance of the Holy Spirit of God. It's the only thing that can change a person. And in our nation, in our culture, our greatest hope is not in our government or any, any official that we happen to elect. It's okay. You should vote. And you should vote for things. And you should decide who's the best candidate. I'm not a, I think we should do that. But they're not our saviors. The only way this nation will ever change is a return. Christ. The return of the hearts and minds and souls of people. And that's what we must pray for. Some of you may have heard the news recently of this pastor in Turkey who had been in prison for two years. He was charged with um, being a part of this coup to overthrow the government. There were false claims. There were false charges. But he had been a pastor serving there for 20 years and somehow they decided this pastor needed, you know, needed to be charged with these uh, with these uh, false allegations of being part of a coup to overthrow the government. He's been in prison for two years. He finally was released on Friday. Uh, and and uh, our government has fought and fought and fought to try to get this man released. And he finally, they finally released him. But you know what they did in the trial? They, they convicted him of being guilty. But then they released him on time already served. In other words, they couldn't just say he's innocent, let him go. They had to, they, they, they just could not do that. They could not face up and say we made a mistake. There are, there, there's no real evidence here, but they convicted him and then let him go. You see, it's just an example of how once people get focused on something that they want to happen, they, they just can't turn their minds against it. And this is what was happening to these chief priests and these, these leaders. And so they've condemned Jesus to death. The next section we, in, in this passage, we see Peter. Jesus predicted Peter was gonna, was going to deny him. And remember what Peter said? No, Jesus! If I have to die for you, I will never deny you. Verse 66, while Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. and When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him closely and says, you, you were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and he went out of the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is, with, uh, this fellow is one of them. It's one of the disciples. He's a follower of Jesus. He, uh, in, after this, um, <clears throat> anyway, he says, uh, I lost my place. And he denied it. I'm sorry, verse 70. 
And while a little while, those standing near Peter said, surely you are one of them. For you are from Galilee. So he's around with other people and they go, oh yeah, aren't you one of those Jesus followers? Aren't you one of those Jesus freaks? That's what you are. You're one of them Jesus freaks. You follow that Jesus guy around. The one they're trying up in the, in the, the thing that they've condemned to death. You're one of his followers. And he began to call down curses on himself and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him before the rooster crows twice. You will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. It happened just as Jesus said. Now I wonder what the significance of the rooster crowing twice was. I wondered. The other gospel accounts just say before the rooster crows. Mark adds the detail. Before the rooster crows twice. You see, I think the first was probably a warning. <laughs> Peter is there. He has the opportunity to speak up for Jesus. The rooster crows. We don't know when the first time he crowed. But he had this opportunity to go, oh yeah. Oh yeah, Jesus said, Jesus said I was going to do this and I said I wasn't. But he is so worried about himself. He's so worried. He's in such great fear that he's going to be tried, that he may be crucified. He's in such great fear that immediately, immediately he says, I don't know him. I don't know what you're talking about. He lied. Because he was scared to death for his life. You see, a lot of times we don't know what will happen when we're placed in those situations. But one thing we know, we talked about this earlier, Jesus called his disciples to absolute, complete surrender of their lives to him. And I believe Peter intended to do that. I believe Peter intended to, he even said, I will die with you, Jesus. I believe, he believed that he could do that. He believed that he had that much faith. He believed that he was that strong. He really did. Or he wouldn't have said it. Peter thought he was the most faithful disciple in all the world. I will never deny you, Jesus. And what did he do? You see, we are called to make a commitment to Christ. But we can't keep that commitment on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to help us. We, we can't just do it by ourselves. Uh, last, uh, uh, my team didn't play yesterday in Mississippi State, so we didn't lose, but that was good. Um, but the last game we, we played, we won. And the quarterback for our team, uh, Nick Fitzpatrick, uh, was a young man who's played, uh, quarterback this he's in his senior year now he's played he started for three years and he's he's racked up some very impressive statistics and during the last game he became the uh the, the number one rushing quarterback in the history of the sec he rushed for more yards than tim tebow yeah he's rushed for more yards than tim tebow and so he became the number one rushing quarterback in, in, as far as the, in the SEC. And after the game, they interviewed him and asked him about it. And, and she said, well, when he came into the SEC, a lot of people said he didn't even belong there. And now here he broke this record. And he said, well, you know, I worked hard and everything. He said, but you know, he said, if my lineman hadn't blocked for me, I wouldn't have gained a yard. He said, I, I owe just as much credit. This record is just as much credit to all my linemen as it is to me. And, and see, the point I'm trying to make is that in football and in team sports, we really know you, you can't do it alone. Every once in a while you hear one braggadocious ball player or something talk about how great he is and wonderful, but he's nothing without his teammates. You're nothing without your teammates, and no matter how good you are, and some of you, we have some of our basketball players down here, and they know team sports. I mean, they want to do their best, but but it, they have to depend upon the other players, or they're nothing. And you see, in the Christian life, it's a team sport. You can't do it alone. Number one, you need other believers, and number two, you got to depend on the Holy Spirit. And see, Peter thought he could do it all by himself. 
He thought he could be the star all by himself. But he couldn't. He failed. The last passage we look at here is the actual the trial before Pilate here in this text. And so Jesus is brought in before Pilate. For chapter 15, verse 1. Very early in the morning, the chief priest and the elders of the teachers of the law and the Sanhedrin reached the decision. They bound Jesus and led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. And the chief priest accused him of many things. So, so Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See so many things they're accusing you of? And, but Jesus still made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. So, Jesus, the only thing he said was, I'm the king of the Jews. All these other charges that they kept bringing against him that there was no basis for. He, you know, he kept silent. He was innocent. The only thing he was guilty of was being who he said he was. Messiah, the Son of God, the King of Jews. That's the only thing he was guilty of. And that's what he was crucified for. Pilate, Pilate, we, we don't have all the story here. We can pair all the gospels. But Pilate, Pilate saw the, the ridiculous claims of the, of the religious leaders. In fact, in John's Gospel, he says, I don't find any fault in this man. I can't find anything wrong with him. He might be crazy, but he didn't do anything wrong. See, even this, this unjust man, who as far as we know, had no religion, he says, this guy hasn't done anything wrong. But, in order to try to, to keep you know, trying to um, accuse Jesus, and so Pilate decides that that during the during the Passover, generally they they released one Jew who was in prison, and so there's this guy Barabbas. You remember the story of Barabbas? He's in prison, and then for insurrection, and then Jesus is there, and so he asks the people. He says, "Okay, I'm going to release one to you. Who do you want me to release? This Barabbas guy who's guilty of insurrection, or, or this Jesus who claims to be the King of the Jews?" And of course they. They clamor that they want Barabbas released and they want Jesus. They want Jesus to be crucified. And in this text, verse 12, he says, what shall I do then with this one you call the king of the Jews, Pilate asked, and they said, crucify him! <laughs> Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. And they shouted all the louder, crucify him! We don't care he didn't commit a crime. He didn't commit any crimes. Just kill him. We hate him. We can't stand him. Kill him. You see, these people, maybe even some of the same ones that one week earlier were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. And he came into Jerusalem. Now many of them are screaming, Crucify him! How easily people are turned. And their minds aren't stayed on the truth and the Word of God. Here they are, screaming, crucify Lord Jesus. And anything wrong. Can't find any crimes. But the chief priests have stirred them up so much that they scream, crucify him. Verse 15, wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them, and he flogged Jesus and handed him over to be crucified. Most of you heard the description of flogging the whip that has three strands. And at the end of the strands was pieces of bone or sharp sticks or something. And then they would lash them across, they would bend them over and they would lash them across the back 39 times. Hitting them with that, that, that whip and pulling it back, which would literally rip most of the meat off the, the back. And so they flogged him and then Turned him over to be crucified. You see, injustice. Injustice is a result of a depraved mind. Injustice is the result of a depraved mind. When I'm mean depraved, it's un depraved means ungodly. Ungodly thinking, an ungodly mind results in injustice. Because a depraved mind justifies injustice. 
A depraved mind will justify injustice. In other words, this is totally injustice what's happening, but the, the Pharisees and the leaders can't see beyond that. Their minds have gotten so far from God, even though these are religious leaders, they are so far from God, they are justifying the unjust crucifixion of Jesus. Depravity leads people down this path of totally unrealistic thinking. A depraved mind says it's okay for people to be slaves. A depraved mind says it's okay if I can get away with it. If I can take somebody and make them my slave, or take somebody and make them my sex slave, that's okay because I'm somehow better than they are. In our country here, years ago, I mean, slavery was justified because they felt like those people they brought from Africa were somehow less human. That's how they justified it. Which is a lie of Satan. You see, depravity justifies injustice. When our minds get so far from God, a depraved mind reasons well, it's okay to molest little children as long as I call it love. You know, that's what's happening in our country right now. They're called pedophiles. And they're using everything they can to justify their actions as being okay. That's one of the next big things coming down the pike. You just wait and see. Maybe ten years before it gets here. We're going to start reducing the age of legally having sex. It's going to start reducing. It's already happening. And the depraved mind says, this is okay. It's what I want. The depraved mind justifies these things. The depraved mind says, it's okay to do anything I want as long as I get what I want. See, we must be careful to avoid depraved thinking because our culture all around us, there's so much depravity, so much ungodly thinking, so much ungodly reasoning that's going on. We must be careful that we renew our minds. That's why Paul says in Romans 12, renew your minds. Renew your minds. It's going to be constantly filled with stuff that's not true. It's going to be constantly filled with depraved type thinking. So you must Renew your mind. You must renew your mind. That's why you come on Sunday morning sometimes, isn't it? I hope this isn't the only time you renew your mind. I hope you do get some renewal of your mind here through worship and through prayer and through the preaching of the Word, but you've got to have more than that because the world is constantly bombarding us, telling us things that are wrong that they call right. Uh, Matt Chandler, a pretty popular pastor these days, tells a story about uh, his son. He came home from, from work one day and his son was playing Xbox instead of doing his chores. And so he sent the little boy to go do his chores. Uh, he went to clean his room. And, and then after cleaning his room, he was, his other household chore was to vacuum the whole house. So uh, Matt says, uh, as, I, as I started unloading the dishwasher, I heard him turn on the vacuum for about 45 seconds. Reed found me and happily reported, I'm done! I said, you vacuumed the whole house? Uh-huh. Son, Superman could not vacuum this whole house in 45 seconds. He said, I did, Dad. Matt says, so I did what any loving father would do. I grabbed his hand and said, let's just walk around and see. We walked around the house, and over in this corner, we found an entire bag of goldfish crackers that looked like someone had intentionally dumped them on the floor and danced on them. I said, Reed, did you vacuum this? I didn't see it. Okay, but this is on the floor. You're supposed to vacuum the floor. I don't know how you missed it. So it goes on and says, we went around the house and vacuumed. They showed him how to vacuum every little thing on the floor. Well, you know, it's 
sometimes we see what we want to see. And we don't see what we don't want to see. And it takes the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to truth in our lives. And any of us here, any of us here, are capable of sin. Even Jesus' most faithful followers are capable of great sin. Our Sunday night study has been studying First and Second Samuel. In Second Samuel we see the man after God's own heart. The only person in all of Scripture described as a man after God's own heart commits the unspeakable. Adultery and murder. Most faithful follower. A man after God's own heart. You see, we must be dependent upon others and upon the Holy Spirit in order if we're going to keep the commitments we've made to Christ. And any of us can be guilty of depraved thinking if we're not careful. Keep your hearts and mind focused on Christ. Continue to renew them in the Word, in prayer, in fellowship with other believers. Keep your hearts and minds renewed so that you will be faithful and keep your commitments to Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this, these passages. They're hard to read, Lord. We, we don't like to think about uh, sin. We don't like to think about these difficult things that happen. We don't like to, to remember all that Jesus suffered. Sometimes we don't want to remember that. But we need to remember. That's why we do regularly do the Lord's Supper to remember what Christ has done. To remember the extent of His love that was poured out for us. The suffering that He went through. To remind of how easy it is for even the most faithful disciple to have a lapse in faith and to fail. We have no salvation without you, Jesus. Absolutely none. And we cannot be even faithful to you without your strength and power of the Holy Spirit within us. Help us, Lord. Renew our minds regularly that we might be a faithful follower of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.